Good evening, everyone. I will have a, I'll do a very, very quick introduction of our main speaker to the, tonight, Jose Araguez. Um, he is an architect, writer, editor, researcher, and educator. Um, one of the, um, the major organizer of this uh, long project called The Building, which materialized into the publication which you can see on the table uh, this evening. He's adjunct professor of, of architecture at Columbia University, where he leads graduate design studios. He has presented his work internationally across Europe, North America, and the in Middle East, and taught besides Columbia at Cornell, Princeton, Rice University in Paris, and University of Granada. And um, he will explain, introduce, tell us the story behind the building as a project, and um, uh, in the first half an hour or so of the event, and then we will, I will then introduce our uh, special guests tonight, who will speak in turn of their response to the building as the project. And uh, I will act as a moderator in the discussion and the Q&A uh, thereafter. So, Jose, please. Um, well, thanks, uh, Doreen, for the introduction. Uh, thanks, Manija, for the amazing, amazing, amazing assistance. Uh, and coordination over the past few months, and uh, thank you to uh, the rest of participants for accepting um, uh, the invitation to today's event. Um, I am uh, extremely happy to be back at the AA, um, basically where this whole endeavor started over um, three years ago. So basically we've, uh, we've come full circle, as you'll see um, in a minute, because although you see it now as a book, um, as Doreen mentioned briefly, um, this is uh, rather a, a kind of self-initiated multi-year discursive uh, project, um, uh, which has four phases. So two symposia organized in 2014, uh, AA and Columbia University within six months, um, seminar, theory seminar at Cornell um, in 2015, and then the actual production and editing of the book, uh, 2016. And then basically uh, what has become uh, a fourth uh, phase of the project in sound right, a series of events um, around um, the US in the spring and now around Europe in the fall to kind of keep fostering the conversation around the agenda, um, but also uh, probably more importantly, to kind of see how different audiences in different geographies react to the purposes of, of uh, the project. Um, <clears throat> basically, the whole thing started with a fairly simple diagnosis. Um, during the early stages of my PhD uh, years ago, um, on the one hand, I was uh, fascinated by the intellectual expansion that I was being exposed to. Uh, but at the same time, it became fairly apparent to me uh, that there wasn't a lot of discussion on architectural design within scholarly circles in architecture. So, in other words, there wasn't a lot of architecture in architecture. Um, so I shared that diagnosis with a number of uh, colleagues, faculty, friends. Uh, everybody seemed to agree, which means there was a kind of repressed quality to the issue. So let's bring it to the surface. Let's gather historians, theorists, PhD candidates, and architects around that which is supposed to establish a common ground for everybody, i.e. architectural thinking as a form of knowledge, with the building as a kind of proxy for uh, architectural thinking or architecture. Uh, and this is something hopefully we'll get to discuss later, the relationship between the two uh, categories. So basically, I've brought here a few pictures of, uh, of those events. Um, I guess I won't have to say much about this uh, one specifically. You guys are familiar with everybody there. It was. Uh, five days before the opening of the uh, 2014 uh, Biennale, um, um, 2nd of June, everybody was there, kind of heated discussions, seminar-like, uh, versus the one with the Columbia, more conference-like. You see Enrique Walker, um, Stan Allen, some of the round tables, Bernard Shumi was in the audience as his building was being presented, uh, John Ackman, Sylvia Levin, Juan Zara Polo, to Michael Young, <clears throat> Vera Bullman, and I'm putting also a few images of the events we've done after publication. Um, so this was nearly a year ago already at the Lisbon Architecture Triennale, that's Andre uh, Tavares, that's with Lars in the official opening in New York, <clears throat> that's at MIT, see Michael Hayes, Anna Mijaki, Amanda Reeser, Rafi Siegel, so Columbia, Bernard Stan, Jorge Otero, Andraos, um, this University of Illinois, Chicago, Bob Sommel, John McMorrow, Sean Keller, Penelope Dean, so LA, Sylvia Levin, uh, Mark Lee, uh, Neil Denari, um, lectured in the uh, summer series at Columbia, and then uh, jumped back to Europe, this epiphany, Kirsten Gears, uh, Christoph Van Gerwey, 
uh, as a College of Architects in Madrid. Um, Stan, again, Emilio Tuñón, uh, Luis Fernández Galeano, <coughs> So, uh, yeah, University of Malaga, uh, just a week after. Just last week, at the house, Philip Ushpun, Jan de Wilder, Irina Davidovici, Roman Stalder. <clears throat> so we basically started to put together some graphic information to kind of have a, very, a better understanding of the scope and uh, impact of the project internationally. Uh, I see some of the locations there. Um, also, um, kind of matrix with all the participants and Contributors, basically, the idea was to convene many, if not most, of the uh, top thinkers in our field, while at the same time appealing to both history theory and design practice. So this matrix is incomplete. Actually, this is as of uh, late August. Uh, we were at uh, nearly 60-40 at the time. Um, uh, the evolution, the graphic uh, uh, identity, how it changes over, I mean, basically across the different post, uh, posters. This is just for the spring in the US. All right. So. Typically, what I do at this point is I share with you um, just very briefly a number of propositions that underpin the theoretical armature of the project. Um, and I'm going to elaborate, just articulate very briefly, right? Uh, so I don't speak for too long. First is to say that the building is a necessary condition for contribution to knowledge in architecture, right? So it's always there. It's either in the foreground, in the background, or in the middle, but it's always there, right? Uh, it is necessary, and actually, we should write about many other things many other aspects, many other layers of knowledge, many other agents, but all of those will be relevant to architecture only insofar as they relate to a building. Mm. The idea is that the necessary condition would be different if the target were urbanism, furniture design, installation design, art, and so on and so forth, right? for the different disciplines within design. Same for the different, uh, dis different disciplines outside of design. Now, <clears throat> this distinction between the different disciplines is important, uh, because um, only if we're capable of accounting for uh, the differences between these different fields comprehensively enough, we'll be able to understand really the interdisciplinary processes that can occur between them and their results. And so while uh, every time or most of the time when we speak about interdisciplinary processes, we tend to emphasize zones of overlap and intersections and so on, here the claim is in a way the opposite to say that first and foremost interdisciplinary processes are rooted in difference. Now, as a result of the theoretical turn of the 1960s, which uh, most of you will be familiar with, uh, architectural history and theory started to establish relationships with uh, non-disciplinary structures and social realms, such as philosophy, linguistics, anthropology, and so on, through the so-called mediatory concepts, concepts that really belong to those other fields, such as reification, uh, signifier, signified, ideology, deconstruction, rhizome, um, and so on. Now, that was um, the beginning of this pattern that uh, we see uh, still very dominant today, by which architectural history and theory tends to import terms, concepts, and theoretical frameworks from other fields to apply to itself. Right? Now, in parallel, but starting just a little bit later, around the mid-70s, more or less, um, the status of the architectural object, and actually here there's another important discussion between well, basically, whether a building is an object or not, uh, this is also um, not clear, we can discuss it later. Um, status of the architectural object became increasingly unstable, right, as it appeared in more and more guises. So let's say the building as the reification of power structures, the building as a facilitator of participatory processes, the building as um, a construct amenable to mirroring processes in the natural world the building as the locus of phenomenological content, the building as the building as, the building as something else, right? Now, this is not a bad thing, right? Uh, this diversification is really an index for the increasing sophistication of architecture as a field of knowledge, right? So that's a good thing. Now, if you look closely enough, it turns out that the flip side of it is that the building itself appears more often as a vehicle, as a medium through which to tap into concerns that belong to other fields rather than itself a realm of research in its own right. So it is in this particular sense that perhaps one of the most controversial claims of this project, um, one could say that actually in the last five decades, uh, the building has been primarily a means and not an end within architectural history and theory. So um, with this project, what we attempt is not to overturn these two tendencies, right? That would be undesirable, actually. As I said, I'm pretty naive. 
but to kind of balance them out a little bit, right? to balance out the two tendencies. Right? And it is uh, in relationship to that goal that the twofold agenda for the project is established. Right? So on the one hand, to discuss what it means for a building to embody a historically significant contribution in terms of a design aspect or a concept relevant to the reading of buildings in general. Right? So to go from the building as something else to the building itself as a domain of research. And second, a little more ambitiously, to see if we can venture ways in which buildings themselves can induce theoretical frameworks that could potentially be, uh, be applicable outside the boundary of the disciplines. So in other words, for architecture's tendency to import to coexist with its capacity to export. <clears throat> In other words, the project um, appeals to architecture specificity to kind of expand its limits and audiences. Right? It appeals to architecture specificity to expand its limits and audiences, as opposed to withdrawing into its own autonomy. Right? And here's where almost naturally a distinction between specificity and autonomy makes itself felt. Right? So we're going to take a few steps till we get uh, till we get to that to that differentiation. First, to say that a building is not form. Right? Or a building is not only form. At the very least, a building is a combination of form and program. Right? Or you could say, well, building is something like a three-dimensional material organization made up of a number of elements and relations between them, what we typically call form, um, that has the capacity of housing um, a set of human or human-related activities, what we usually call program. Right? Now, in architecture, it's particularly important, as opposed to other fields, to distinguish between discursive and representational knowledge. Right? So what we mean by discursive knowledge, at least in this project, is just in its classical sense. You know, it's, it's Foucaultian sense, more, more uh, recent, but just the classical sense, right? the kind of knowledge that involves premises, narratives, judgments, inferences, ideas, concepts, and conclusions as channeled through thought and expressed through language. Right? Channeled through thought and expressed through language. Right? Now, that is fundamentally different from representational knowledge, which is the kind that proceeds through images, drawings, and models. Right? It's just particularly relevant in the case of architecture. It relates to um, uh, the design disciplines in general, such as, for example, graphic analysis or illustration, so not only architecture. Right? So what you see in the book, in so far as the book is not a building, obviously, the book, the book is a book, um, contribution to the, um, of the book is supposed to fall in the domain of discursive knowledge, even though representational knowledge is used precisely to produce discursive knowledge. <clears throat> now, if all of that holds, then we can claim that architectural thinking is something like the practice of producing discursive knowledge out of the analysis, conceptualization, and discussion of aspects of two inextricably linked domains, that of the building and that of the design process leading to the building, which as a subset of architectural thinking, we can refer to as architectural design thinking. <clears throat> Therefore, um, architectural thinking is a distinct domain of knowledge within the map of the humanities and the social sciences, right? basically the, uh, the map of human knowledge, whose attributes reach well beyond form and aesthetics. Right? And many of them are relatable to at least uh, ontology, well, I say ontology, technology, and several modes of logic and phenomena. Of course, I'm, I'm not going to uh, elaborate on that philosophically, but um, um, I'm, I'll, just, I'll just throw it out there in case we can pick it up later. OK, so now we get to the point where we can discuss, uh, discuss this uh, distinction of these two terms, which get conflated uh, all too often, in my view. So as many of you will know, um, Autonomy has um, several branches, um, kind of several approaches within architecture. But what it does fundamentally is that it reduces architecture to a kind of itselfness, rooted in the essence of form, which is meant to create a system out of that reaction, hermetically sealed. Right? We hear terms like immanent or self-referential right? to, 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 to describe the system. And this system is meant to fall outside of time. Right? It's supposed to be timeless in some sense. Right? Now, why, it, why is architecture thinking not autonomous by definition? Well, first and foremost, because architecture is not form only. Right? So 
These formal reductions are certainly a methodological option, right? But they're not written into architecture's constitutive purposes. They're just an option, right? Now, <clears throat> second, yes, uh, the search for timelessness and universals uh, is, again, another option. But on the other hand, as we know, architecture is bound to its time, which triggers the need for historical knowledge as a matter of course, right? So again, universality and timelessness are just options. Right? And third, architectural thinking is not some closed off epistemological field. Right? If such a thing was possible, it is not possible to begin with, but it's connected to other fields and to actually culture at large, right? However, at the same time, architectural thinking is definitely a specific domain. Why? Because the, the um, characteristics of the outcome, yeah, the building itself, and those of the process leading up to the building exhibit a number of particularities which made them fundamentally different from a piece of music, a novel, a painting, or a sculpture, let's say, or a film, regardless of the analogies that we can establish a posteriori between those two uh, different mediums. Right? So in short, one could say that autonomy is grounded in specificity, but specificity does not imply autonomy. Therefore, capitalizing on this combination of specificity and non-autonomy, um, project, and this is perhaps the most important phrase of the whole endeavor, aims to produce a kind of knowledge which is at once architecturally specific and yet generalizable. Right? Architecturally specific and yet generalizable, grounded in the specificities of architectural thinking, and yet potentially applicable outside the boundaries of the discipline. Okay, so I'm going to say just quickly a few words about the structure of the book. Basically, uh, there are 30 case studies, and um, the six categories, the six uh, labels um, under which these uh, case studies fall were chosen deliberately for being at once um, directly relevant to architecture, but then at the same time elemental enough as to be potentially uh, germane to fields outside of, uh, outside of architecture. Mm -hmm. So basically, authors were uh, asked to, picked, to pick uh, a building built or designed, not necessarily built, could be designed within the last 25 years, through which they could uh, tackle the twofold agenda that I explained earlier. So that constitutes the main section of the book. Mm -hmm. Then there is a second section where you'll find five longer critical essays um, addressing this question of architectural thinking as a form of knowledge, partly through reflections on the rest of materials in the book. Yeah? So the conversation is kept going within the pages of the book, as opposed to just frozen there. <clears throat> and then third, uh, uh, five uh, short essays, um, which um, address this uh, renewed interest uh, in the building in relation to the current uh, state of architectural education. <clears throat> All right, so the last uh, section of the presentation, what I do in a different tone, that was the kind of more uh, theoretical approach. Now what I do is I basically share with you uh, five examples from the book that speak to the first part of the agenda, and then another five examples that speak to the second part of the agenda. So in terms of buildings which embody a historic significant contribution in terms of a design aspect or a concept relevant to the reading of buildings in general, um, this is Penelope Dean uh, writing about the anyhow, I mean, she says a number of interesting things, I mean, just to uh, keep it short, I'm going to just say one, uh, which to me is the more interesting one. She says that um, while early 20th century works of architecture discarded the room, yeah, they eliminated the idea of room through, um, uh, through the uh, plan livre, the, the uh, open plan, uh, just to reinstate the wall as a special divider in, in new guises. Here what happens is the opposite, right? So Fujimoto, that's according to her, is that she keeps the principle of the room, and then eliminates the vertical divider. Right? So um, in her view, what Fujimoto does is that she replaces the vertical divider with the uh, separation, the offset between the different platforms uh, with the nominal thickness of the actual edge of the platform, which is equivalent to saying that he's flipping architecture, he's flipping modern architecture sideways. Right? So it's like turning it 90 degrees. Right? So what she does is that she places the building in a certain lineage and then tries to illustrate the way in which this building adds something to that lineage, right? Offers something new to it. Not by just saying it, right, but to, by, by actually arguing, by, by illustrating it. Um, because on this 
with a beautiful essay on uh, Ensemble Studios Truffle House, he says something to the effect that this building is not designed, but actually what happens is that um, what's prescribed is its construction process. So for those of you who are not familiar with the building, what happens there is that um, well, dig up a hole in the earth, fill it up with hay, pour concrete around it, remove the earth, have a calf eat away at the hay, at the stacks of hay, and that way you get the interior space. Yeah? And actually, I just realized today, after so many presentations, that the calf grows as it keeps eating hay. Yeah? So, <laughs> I don't know this, I don't know if is <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so anyway, I mean, there's always a risk of uh, not knowing actually how the thing is going to look like when you use uh, Rainforest concrete, right? But what you do is you, uh, I mean, through the elaborate use of the cast, you try to minimize that risk. Well, here the opposite is the case. There is a kind of intentional roughness to a technique which fits further the um, sort of unpredictability of the result. So, in other words, the cast is used to introduce uncertainty as opposed to certainty, right? That, that, that's where the contribution lies. Um, John McMorrow writing on uh, MVRDB's Expo 2000 Dutch Pavilion, she says this building enacts a modification to the so called 1909 theorem, as identified by Rancujas in Delirious, New York. So that's the image on the right, where you see this suburban house plot being supported in this massive uh, steel structure. She says that in the Delirious version of, of the diagram, uh, the semantic and environmental autonomy of each floor is kept, and it, it, it's actually prioritized. Whereas what happens here is that those uh, separations are reconsidered so that the whole building functions as an ecological mechanism. Right? So the surpluses and excesses of one floor and then are then reutilized on the next floor in terms of air, uh, heat, uh, light, water, and so on. Right? So, <clears throat> so basically, uh, according to him, the pavilion's open structure uh, materializes a principle of interconnection through separation and integration. Right? Interconnection through separation and integration, thereby adding a further step to the lineage, um, which uh, one could, whose origin we can place around the 1909 theorem. This one is an easy one. Juan Antonio Cortez writing on uh, San Dai Media Tech. This is an uh, obvious case of uh, uh, free plan as well, where there is an independence between plates, skin, and tubes. And the contribution here, relative to the Maison Domino, uh, lies in the fact that the tubes are replaced by, well, not the tubes, actually, the original columns are replaced by these clusters of tubes which uh, free up space inside to be able to house the vertical, the vertical flows. Right? So it's an addition, an evolution to the uh, Maison Domino in the eyes of Juan Antonio Cortez. And then lastly, Marc Fouchot from Eteja writing on the Relic Center, he sees the contribution here around what he calls the management of threshold. Right? So basically, the walls that and normally tend to separate the different soundscapes within a building, are here replaced by a thin arches in pretension, a floating screen so you can actually build it on a carpet, that create inside these long topographical thresholds, right? these artificial horizons, which um, create these low variations from places for verbal exchange to places of total quietness. Um, she says a number of other things also in terms of uh, light and in terms of function. For example, the fact that the topography subsumes the function of a seat and uh, it's basically used as a giant sofa, right? So this idea of the management of threshold, uh, thresholds applies energetically, distributionally, and in terms of the actual performativity of the building. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, five examples to speak to the second part of the agenda, uh, obviously more uh, ambitious, but you see hints of it at least, at least hints of it. Right? Uh, so, quoting from Stalin, who writes about Mancini Tunyos Musak building in Leon, he says, uh, literally, quote, uh, the project's accomplishment is not so much to resolve contradictions or to make didactic statements as it is to suspend and dissolve apparent oppositions. Right? So, if you extract that statement, and I extract it away from the building, then you realize that actually it's easily applicable to realities, problems, and discursive um, elements that belong in other fields, right? So it's abstract enough, especially if developed into something more of a theoretical framework that could be applicable to uh, a number of other things outside of architecture. Similarly here, I think Santiago writing about the typical suburban American house is one of the most appreciated examples in the book uh, for, for uh, reasons that are, I think, interesting, but I'm not going to elaborate on here. Um, basically, he argues that this type of house embodies a novel way of thinking how a set of things, right, so not only rooms, but also information, people, objects, can be linked, systematized, 
organized. Right? The resulting space, he calls it super urban, and he argues it basically challenges received ways of conceiving of boundaries and connections. Right? So effectively, what he's saying is that into, into an organizational model that he's identified uh, in a building, you can actually read an epistemological one, that is to say, a way of understanding reality beyond the example of that specific building. <clears throat> Amanda Reeser uh, she comes up with this uh, very attractive uh, uh, phrase concept in my view, architectural sameness. How can we talk about that? And uh, she says, having, there has been a uh, search of interest in academia, according to her, um, in terms uh, around uh, questions of derivatives, replicas, copies, uh, allusions, um, and so on. Uh, and we lack a theoretical framework in relation to which distinguish these uh, related but non-identical terms, she says. To me, the most important thing, though, is that this idea of sameness, intentional sameness, could be applicable to fields like photography, art history, or even metaphysics, where the uh, problem of identity and difference has uh, occupied philosophers for uh, millennia. <clears throat> Is Alexander Vukia, uh, also in the audience, uh, writing on OMS Dubai uh, Renaissance. My interpretation of her uh, beautiful piece is that uh, she writes about what she calls iconolatry as opposed to iconicity. Um, she sees this building as a kind of absolute exterior that is capable of absorbing and in turn projecting any meaning, right? absorbing and in turn projecting any meaning, which means that this idea of iconolatry would be the idea that uh, a building's very condition as an icon can be determined by its, its unstable semantic identity, right? Unstable semantic identity. So she says that in 21st century late capitalism, uh, because of the obsession with images and their rapid uh, proliferation, basically all of this dynamic generates this um, instability in terms of the meaning of things. And within that uh, uh, realm, the uh, OMA project can be seen as a kind of epitome of that. And then lastly, uh, Andrew Benjamin was a philosopher, that, that, that's why there's, there's no picture there. Uh, he distinguishes between uh, building in uh, regular letter and building in italic. He says building in um, um, regular letter is something like the uh, networks of relations that precede the conception and construction of a building, right? exterior and anterior to the building, versus building in italic, which would be the internal networks of relations that are actually just disciplinary and embodied in the, in the building itself. So he argues that the latter, right, the disciplinary one, uh, should be thought of in terms of the possibility of othering the global, right? othering the global, which is what, what he calls countermeasure. Right? Destabilizing, reconfiguring, re redistributing, or reconceptualizing the preceding network, uh, networks of relations that uh, exist prior to um, the existence and the conception of the building. <clears throat> okay, and just to end, I typically show this slide with uh, some 60 concepts pertaining to um, architectural thinking. Uh, it turns out if you uh, zoom into this um, field of knowledge, it, it gets, it becomes really sophisticated, nuanced. Um, it cannot be reduced to something generic like spatial thinking, right? Often. Uh, in a meeting where there are uh, people from political science, uh, from art history and so on, the person in architecture gets labeled as somebody who understands this spatial thinking. It's much more than that, it's much more nuanced. And it's so complex that actually one could envision picking out two or three of these concepts, starting to study the relations between them with a view to generate a theoretical framework, but even more ambitiously, a system of thought that could become meaningfully relevant, that could meaningfully alter fields um, outside of architecture. So this is the double expansion that this project is um, kind of trying to accomplish. So an implosion, right? an, an expansion from within, yeah? as in zooming in with a microscope, and then an expansion into out, right? from architecture to the outside. Yeah? So um, this attempt to grow um, architecture's discursive capacities from within in order to uh, ignite its potential to expand its limits and audiences is the way in which uh, we believe that we could attempt to uh, bridge the spheres of history theory on the one hand, and on the other hand, studio culture and practice. Yeah? And that for that to be successful at all, 
the current uh, architectural history theory project would have to be expanded as opposed to contract. Right? It sounds like focusing on the building is a kind of narrowing down, but as I've been trying to argue, and as Dora Epstein Jones and Philip uh, Ursprung identify in the book, actually it's the opposite. It will have to be expanded in terms of how its meaning and its role is understood within the general map of human knowledge, right? even potentially beyond the humanities and the social sciences to um, domains such as computer science or the culture of Silicon Valley. Why not? All right, thank you. Thank you, Jose. And um, that was a, a, a very thorough introduction to the discussion that's going to ensue tonight. And uh, I'd like to introduce um, our three special invited speakers and uh, who hasn't been part of the project so far, but they act as an external uh, critic and an offering their contribution and their take, um, uh, not at all the, uh, less important than, um, than, let's say, the written component of this project. Um, firstly, there's uh, Moray Fraser as a professor of architecture and global culture and vice dean of research at the Butler School of Architecture, UCL, he has published extensively on design research, architecture history and theory, urbanism, post-colonialism, and cultural studies. Currently, he is general editor for the 21st edition of Sir Bannister Fletcher's Global History of Architecture, uh, which will come um, next year. Uh, there's Douglas Spencer, um, the author of The Architecture of Neoliberalism, which came out last year. And uh, as a critical theorist of architecture, he has contributed to numerous journals, including the Journal of Architecture, Radical Philosophy, Architectural Design, Eflux, A-Files, New Geographies, and Volume. He teaches at AA and um, the University of Westminster. Thirdly, we have Beth Hughes, um, the head of architecture at the Royal College of Art, Education in Australia, she worked for several practices before joining Office for Metropolitan Architecture, OMA, in 2004. As an associate, she, has, she was responsible for projects in London, Latvia, and the Middle East. In 2011, Beth established her own practice in Athens, Greece, uh, and now based in London. Her work has been extensively published and awarded in several international competitions. And, um, and we do have um, our current um, interim director, Samantha Hardingham, uh, who will, she, apologies from her that she missed the first half because of a meeting, but she will join us for the Q&A session later on. And um, can we um, invite the speaker to, um, they'll take turn to offer their response to the project. Um, uh, Moray, please. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, um, I've, just, I've been asked to respond to the book, so basically you have read the book. Uh, that was the first start. Um, and then so I thought I'd do is just, um, just talk about my, my response, you know, what I, how I see the book, how I see the project, etc. I won't go into any great detail. I think we're only meant to speak for a few minutes. Um, I mean, the first thing to say is to praise Jose for doing such an amazing job. What a feat. Um, editing a lot of people myself, I know what, a, what, a, what an achievement it is even to get this thing done. Um, there's obviously got lots and lots of content, a very diverse range of speakers, etc. Um, uh, sorry, writers, and um, you know, a lot of very interesting ideas. Okay, that's, that's the first sentence. Okay, um, but I presume I'm not here just to do back patting. Uh, I'm sure that's not the, uh, the, the purpose of this exercise. So I, I'm going to try and offer a, a critique from my point of view. Um, please take these as suggestions. You might disagree completely. But anyway, but I was sort of looked at what it was. And then if I was kind of, sort of doing this kind of imaginary book review, I guess that's kind of what I'm about to do now. OK, so um, the first critique. So there's a couple of critiques. The first one of the framework, uh, just the, the way in which it's been set up, etc. The way there's kind of conceptual idea. And then secondly, kind of, you know, the kind of content, the, what people have written about in the book. Um, so the first one, um, yes, I, I think um, possibly, Jose, you're a bit too obsessed with US East Coast academia. Um, it's a very particular uh, culture. Um, not one that um, all of us agree with. 
Uh, you know, so I get slightly worried there's a sort of stereotyping um, of this as somehow there's some kind of norm, some kind of uh, given condition in thinking about architecture. I'm tied to hasten to add, I don't think it is. Um, it strikes me that one of the things that East Coast academia has done really, uh, other than the impact of neoliberalism over the last two or three decades, is basically is to work as hard as possible to deny any material conditions for architecture whatsoever. Uh, I mean, I think this has been somehow this has been the subconscious intellectual task um, as a sort of retreat from engagement, maybe. Um, and instead, there's been the sort of the creation of architecture as almost exclusively an intellectual activity. Um, and, I, and I think this is this is a problem. I can see your book as an attempt to uh, to uh, to try and remedy this, to grasp this uh, uh, by by the horns, etc. But. Um, and I think you're a hero for what we're trying to do this, and maybe maybe you will do this, or maybe this is a beach trail, and uh, things are much worse than we think. Um, uh, so, so there's that point there. And just if you think about it, I mean, I don't recognise quite a lot of this group, and I don't particularly recognise, if you know what I mean. I mean, the, you could compare. I would say perhaps something like Beatrice Colomina, who sees architecture in terms of media, in terms of photographs, etc., analyses in terms of that, and com compare them with somebody like Adrian Forty who's uh, my mentor as well, you know, who's been writing material architectural history and dealing with buildings and dealing with these kind of complex uh, readings of buildings while focusing on the buildings as well. So all I would just uh, put, the, put, the, um, put the big warning out there is that I don't think this is an, uh, essentially the condition or the normative condition that I get slightly worried, you know, that we frame our arguments around, uh, around that. So that's my one, my one worry about that, etc. The other thing that did strike me is that there's possibly uh, another condition, which is it's, it's too easily to accept that somehow there's a conceptual di di distinction between design, in, whether in academia or practice, and also with the way in which we can think about the subject and we construct it in the architectural history and theory. Um, again, I think this is pretty well entrenched, as far as I can see, in a lot of the East Coast acad academic schools in America, and obviously in certain in, in Europe as well. I think there is a slight tendency to, to divide these up, etc. And I also sense that there was a sense in your book you're trying to put these, uh, somehow bring these together again to reunite them as well. But again, I don't think that's necessarily a given condition. It is applied everywhere. And I will, I'll say something a bit at the end about what I would call design research in architecture. So anyway, that's my... Uh, that's my two worries about the kind of the overall framing of it. In terms of the contents, I mean, there's obviously a lot of very bright people writing very interesting stuff, but I think there's there's a particular view of architecture in there which I've got a slight worry with, and I think this is absence about any kind of discussion about this idea of time, of, of duration, of use, or a sort of a, of a sort of depth of, of building. Um, I think somewhere in, um, uh, in, the, in the thing, Philip Bursprung has sort of said to you, oh, this is a bit like the 20. 14 Biennale, you know, exhibition by by Kulas, etc. And you say yes, yes, etc. But and he said he thought that that exhibition had got almost universal plaudits. Uh, he said somewhere in his essay he wrote as well. My experience is completely opposite. I mean, I think most people I know actually thought it was terrible. It was absolutely shockingly bad. Uh, probably one of the worst Biennales. Um, so I was quite amazed at that. And I think it was this I, I, inability to sort of integrate the the way in which there's sort of elements and all that kind of fundamental stuff seemed to sort of break with this notion of, of buildings as these having these deeper histories of having time and, and, and use and duration built into them, etc. Um, how they're moulded, how appropriated, etc. So not just about design. So I get the feeling that there's a sort of missing thing there. It wasn't one of your categories. Uh, there was nothing really about this depth of time, etc. And I think in that sense, the thing, the thing is to say, it's like he's worried about this ex novo kind of thing, this sort of myth of the tab tabula rasa, which might be the last standing myth of the Enlightenment, maybe. Um, that somehow the, these are sort of uh, new things, etc. It seems to deny this out of layering you write about building, maybe it disconnects it from, you know, from what it's been, what it actually is. It disconnects it from other buildings as well. So I think there's a, also a kind of concern there, really, that um, maybe there's a kind of another aspect of the building, of, the, of its kind of wider meaning that's been sort of um, uh, left out from that. So anyway, so that's that would be my, my, my starters for 10. I'd, I thought I'd just maybe go through a few of the just, so, just for illustration, just go. I'm not going to, as it, as it was said in the introduction, I'm sort of currently ed ed editing this new global history of architecture, deep history of architecture. And now, just not to have this kind of flat ontology of history, it's really to look at discontinuities, changes, breaks in histories, disruptions, etc. But nevertheless, there's something about you know looking at material both cross culturally and also uh, in deeper history that makes you really kind of think things. Uh, Think things are fresh, so I'm not going to go into any great detail because we haven't got time. But this is a kind of I think this is a quite an amazing piece. This is a, a sculpture of a Sumerian le le ruler called Gudea from 
roughly about 2200 BC. It's um, on his lap. Uh, he, he commissioned a building. This is a plan of the building that he commissioned. Uh, this is uh, 4,200 years old or so, something like that as well, you know, kind of stuff. This was a point at which, you know, and it's the, probably the earliest drawings. There probably were other drawings or other broad representations, abstractions of buildings before. But, you know, this idea, you know, this has been going on for a very long time, this idea of, sort of the removal of the building uh, from this killing. So, again, I think we're a bit, we get a bit obsessed with our maybe more recent history. Probably this is kind of the myths of the Renaissance and all the other things that kind of, you know, get you know, propagated in, in, our, in architectural history as well. So, I think it'd be worthwhile thinking about that. Um, forward a long way. This is the some uh, paintings done of the building of the Great Mosque in Samarkand. This is early 15th century. Uh, this was uh, recorded for the, again, the ruler who had commissioned this thing. This was to celebrate his great contribution, etc. And this is essentially just the, the drawing of the building site. It's about the, kind of the social organisation of labour, orchestration there as well. Um, it's about power. Uh, it's about all the other things that kind of come into buildings. This is not the first uh, representation of a building site. There was lots of other ones as well. But this idea of, sort of seeing the labour processes, the kind of other wider parts of history, again, I think goes back uh, a, a long way. Um, and now this also becomes a social record. The elephant in, in the, down in the, the bottom corner is, is there because it was so unusual. People hadn't seen elephants before. This was part of the, the, the USP of the building. They, they brought the materials from elephants from India as part of the, um, the Tiburu Congress in, in that country. So. So there's these kind of as of other kinds of things there, and you think, well, maybe that's some um, kind of old uh, building as well. But I think I think that actually this idea of a sort of building that somehow builds this kind of uh, sort of deeper history also into its kind of uh, current condition is probably well represented by this building here, as you'll probably recognise the El Fuller Money by in Hamburg by Hirschhorn de Mure and etc. Which I find well, it's sort of fascinating uh, uh, new new uh, building here, partly obviously because this idea of the kind of return to the notion of the palimpsest of this thing of uh, there's been overlayered in time, this old building you get built on, um, which you know is reminiscent of the kind of the older kind of forms, constructions, the mythical Tower of Babel, the Tower of uh, Etamenanke in, 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 Babel, in Babylon, etc. And this idea of this kind of um, buildings that get overlaid on each other, put on each other's superimposition of histories and meanings on top of each other and in place. Um, and again, you can see this idea here, this idea of the, the layering of building. You've got the big escalator, the stairway to heaven down there. You've got the kind of you've got the precious temple at the top, which is your now your opera house, etc. So there's this kind of sort of other reading of the building, but also you can read into this kind of more recent concerns, there's a cool housing culture of congestion, a certain uh, logic of production of today, etc. And so it strikes me that these um, buildings, this is sort of a sort of a, probably a sort of a deeper history that needs to be explored and really perhaps isn't uh, so much in the building, and obviously the building now is also a, is, is a commodity, it's a piece of capitalism, it's, uh, it's, it's part of the sales pitch for um, uh, for Hamburg, etc. So it has this very contemporary economic uh, use as well, but also mixed in with these kind of other kind of value systems as well. So I think there's a kind of a possibly, um, you know, a, a wider, deeper kind of way of thinking about this idea of returning in the, the building. Um, and then I think I would just finish off by just saying, that, you know, that I think uh, for me, one of the interesting things I'm, in, in, I'm trying to promote these days is this idea of design research and architecture. You know, that there is a kind of a form of knowledge production and creativity so that comes through architecture, through the making of projects projects so or the kind of projects as well. And this seems in with other things like thinking about architectural history and theory and other kind of intellectual ideas and that this is actually a continuum and we should be looking at ways of sort of entwining these things there. I always, I always put this up, I was, I'm, I'm intrigued by me. The first time I've ever come across the, the term design research was in this book by Elio Saarinen, uh, the father of Eero, in uh, 1943 when he actually uses the word design research and tries to talk about this conceptual way of how, how, you, how an architect designs a city and how the city operates etc. which involves both so thinking about the projected city coming back and how it might be unpeeled and also the, pro the projects you need to design at the same time to create that city, etc. And this sort of dialectic between the kind of forward and backward approaches to design. So, and I think, and this is also based on a kind of a deep, um, uh, sort of a deeper understanding of, of you know, kind of the understanding of the history and theory, etc. While also very much integrated with this idea of proposition, etc. I think there are projects out there which are looking at building, the building in a much more uh, sort of responsive uh, Great away. This is the uh, project by two of my colleagues, Neil McLaughlin and Yorio Manolopoulou. This was at the uh, last Biennale, the Irish Pavilion called Losing Myself. It takes one of Neil McLaughlin's buildings, which is an Alzheimer's Centre in Dublin, which you can see the plan there, and tries to get a, a sort of a, a way of thinking about this building, about memories of this building, about what happens with the loss of memory of the building, etc. But it both relates to 
the form of, of the of the space and the way in which the building is designed, but also uses it as a as a research tool really to think about the kind of processes of finding one's way around architecture, how architecture can respond to this. This is one of the kind of time lapse uh, drawings that comes out of this as well. And so, I think. Personally, I would say that I would say you worry that the idea of somehow injecting the building back into architectural history and theory. This might be kind of uh, uh, one one way of reading this book. And then I think there's actually there's actually more uh, possibly more uh, fluid, more nimble ways of, uh, of of bringing in this thinking about buildings and design and things like that all together. And I think that the answer lies somewhere in design research. Um, so first of all, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm really pleased to be here at the AA this evening. Um, so by way of uh, introduction, I'd like to preface everything by saying that I have a, a sympathy for the project. I'm intrigued by the possibility of what this project suggests and applaud the ambition of returning the object of architecture, the building, to the centre of the conversation, as it has been conspicuously absent, especially from places like studio, for quite some time. As a practitioner, all of my thinking around architecture is mentally filtered through the lens of design. And therefore, in essence, a building, a projection of a building that will formulate my ambitions and intent, uh, are the way in which I formulate all of the work that I do. But I say this with a very large caveat around the definition of the term building. Um, this is also something that um, my students constantly resist. <laughs> um, I think Mark Cousins in his afterward alludes to this challenge, the, the final rush to suddenly make a building somewhere out of kind of many months of research. And so I recognize the kind of um, anxiety that Jose is trying to bring to the foreground. So I, I advocate that it is critical to understand that processes of research, which is where I think I, I fundamentally agree with you as design as research, um, uh, the process of testing and exploring are, are the ultimate agency of architecture. And I, and I see that this is where this is, um, the building is the place in which all of these forces come together. Um, and that, that sometimes that has been lost in the translation. So I would very much advocate for that coming to the foreground. But as I sort of immersed myself rather intensively this past week in the writings of the building and watched some of the conference in Colombia, I sensed that that's not what has happened, <laughs> or that, that's, that that opportunity has not come into the foreground. So that materialization of design as research as being potentially one of the conversations that, which the building would frame um, is, is not yet tangible. So I wanted to sort of posit um, three potential uh, questions or issues that I see with the, with the form, formulation, formulation of, of the document, I guess. Um, to, to, to start a discussion around it. So the first problem I see is around definition. So um, I think the book presents a very compelling survey of buildings. They're nice buildings. I like these buildings. I'm interested by these buildings. Um, but I would suggest it portrays a very narrow view of what architecture is and what architectural practice is today. Um, and what I would like to consider as relevant to my field or discipline. Um, and I, I think that uh, if we want to create a new body of knowledge, then our definition of what that that object that we are that we are discussing should, in, should encapsulate all of those discussions that we want to have. So rather than understanding a building as a structure with a roof and walls and such as a house or a factory, I find the term in, inadequate and reductive for the work that I'm interested in, the work that we're doing at the school, and that the conversations that I would like to have around um, architectural practice. So that, I think that comes up in the conference. Um, I think Michael Meredith suggests that we could talk about the body of work potentially or architecture or the project. I realize the term project is somehow contentious in some cases, but um, I think the term the building and the fact that the book specifically restructs it to singular buildings is quite restrictive in its, in its um, framing of the discipline. So um, I think Amal starts to talk about a project, Amal Adreas, um, Dean of Columbia, that starts to talk about some of the, the limitations that I find in, in this definition of building. So she brings forward this student project by Namju Kim at MIT called the Storehouse for Earth. And I, I think what's really beautiful about this project, and that this is what Amal states about it, so I'm sort of paraphrasing, that it, it defines a new arc, uh, horizon of what architecture could be. So this kind of... Um, uh, this, it's, a, it's sort of a roof for a glacier, which I find quite poetic in itself. But also, she, she, she talks about the project in, in the long tradition of, of building that serves as infrastructure, architecture and infrastructure working together. And the, the project also talks about a geological register, a timepiece, 
It's also not for human occupation, even though it takes on quite distinct building form. But it starts to um, address questions that I think are fundamental to, to our practice today and that architects should be engaged with. And what I'm concerned about is in the limitation of what a building is defined as, we limit those questions that we al allow ourselves to engage with. Um, so she refers to it as a sort of expanded field of what the discipline should be or could be, similar to she equates it to also these plastic balls that are put on top of the reservoirs in California as potential projects or spaces of intervention for architecture. And I think that this is something that we're also exploring at the, um, at the, the Royal College of Art. So again, sorry, this is the idea about um, architecture and infrastructure being a project. It's a long ongoing tradition. It's not something new, but what does that new infrastructure look like? Um, and so I, I'm bringing forward these um, two projects from the Royal College of Art of two students of ours last year. So Isabel was looking at um, uh, palm oil plantations in Borneo. Her project worked at this kind of massively territorial scale, but then it also came down to the scale of soap and how she might use soap to infiltrate into these, these palm oil plantation fields. I think these questions that she was asking that raised also questions about labour, um, neoliberalism in these contexts, ecology, they are questions of our discipline and they must appear in our conversation. And so if we limit the, the field to the building and the traditional understanding of that term, I think we limit the conversations that we enable ourselves to have. Um, similarly, um, this project by Toby um, was looking at coffee plantations in Vietnam and how water collection could become, and, and new forms of irrigation could become a kind of architectural project in themselves. But what was beautiful about these both of these projects is that not only did they discuss a kind of very technological um, concern that would be maybe traditionally understood as part of, of, of an infrastructural project, they discussed the power of these things, the agency of these projects, to have agency within human relations. And I think that's where there's a fundamental question for me. Um, I think if we were to go back in time, I think if you look at the work of people like ArchiZoom and Super Studio, um, they dabbled at very peripheral definitions of the discipline, I would suggest. But if you understand it as a body of work, it then becomes a question that I would understand a question about building or a building about a question about architecture that is that is very important and very fundamental and that that uh, we we must examine in our in our work. So my second conversation is around method and I, I've slightly forgotten the slides that I have coming up. Yes, okay, all right. <laughs> so my question about method is. Um, it is a nice survey of buildings, but, but my concern is, again, this thing that it's limited to the discussion only around the building itself in tectonic forms. And I don't, I don't think that that's... I think that might be a function of the challenge that was put in front of the contributors, that they did not necessarily know in this first pass at doing this how to, how to tackle these things. And people do discuss social relationships, et cetera, but I think in the discussion of the buildings, I would like to understand a far greater um, relationship back to those sociopolitical questions that, that are essential to me in the practice of architecture. Um, and I think that's where the agency of architecture lies, its ability to construct a subject. And for me, the subject had become the object, and that was highly problematic in my understanding of the reading of the work. Um, so I think the, the contributions unfold a kind of experience and, and, and discussion around a, a, a building, but in the majority they fall short of unpacking the many layers that go into constructing the, these buildings. So, and I don't mean layers of um, construction technology, I mean the, the process of constructing these buildings as, as a project and the way in which the argument is communicated through that process. Um, I also saw them as a kind of, um, I found it very hard to read the buildings in relationship to one another. So there is an assembly of buildings, but I, I was unable to read a body of knowledge through that process. So each individual project read nicely. I was able to extract an understanding of that project, but I found it very difficult to, um, to put them in relationship to one another, to, to, to construct an epistemology, if that's what the ambition of this project is. Um, I think I, I had a slightly different reading of Andrew Benjamin's uh, contribution to the, to the book, which which is interesting in itself. I think um, I read that he he problematizes this this situation that I'm that I'm experiencing. That the the discussion around the building ends up being 
around the artefact alone without consideration of the network that is essential to reading those artefacts in themselves. So for me, I can't understand this work by Aguilavakis if I don't understand this work by Aguilavakis and I don't understand this building in Athens and then I don't understand this reading of Athens in itself. Um, and I think that that's absolutely fundamental to, to any project that I would work on and also in terms of understanding the power of relationships that architecture has the power capacity to establish is the relationship of the artifact to the network. And to me, Andrew Benjamin is suggesting that there's immense power and potential in being able to do that in reading it through the building, but that's not necessarily happening. And so that the, the call is for a kind of a greater um, uh, challenge around that, I guess. Um, especially in relationship to the, the idea of place, which I also thought was strangely absent from the discussion and the representation of a lot of the buildings. For me, to understand a project and its agency as a piece of architecture, I, I always have to understand the place and the relationship of that, of, of that form or that change in that body of knowledge in the way that it relates to that context. Um, so I guess my feeling was that there was a sort of limitation in the scope because the, the identification had been around the word the building, which meant that people kept talking only about the building, which diminished the capacity to talk about what I think is most essential in architecture, which is the creation of the subject. Um, and so finally, and I don't have any slides for this apart from the word, if the ambition is the ability of us to take architectural thinking and export it to other disciplines, I think the, the previous two issues are fundamental to resolve because we have to be able to put these things in context to one another and have a discussion across all of them to be able to export that to someone else. And for me, the, the power relationships that architecture has the capacity to establish must be, be part of that conversation in, in order to have that, that, that capacity to move outwards. And I found that it was quite limited in the way that those things were discussed. So I find it hard to relate to other disciplines <laughs> if, if those discussions haven't happened internally. So on the whole, I'm, I'm excited by the potential. I'm not convinced that it quite got there yet. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, everything that Murray said at the start. <laughs> so thanks for it, no, genuinely, thanks very much for the, the uh, invitation uh, to come and speak about this book. And I, I suppose that, um, you won't be surprised that I'm also going to have some kind of critical commentary on what you, what you have to say. I mean, uh, certainly in the, uh, what I see is the kind of denigration of mediation, the, the presentation that mediation is the, the kind of problem that architecture suffers under, I can only take that as a kind of challenge, as a friendly challenge. So that, that's what I'm going to present. And I'm going to focus actually just on, on your introduction to this. So... Um, in your introduction, called Introduction to Buildings, Discursive Building, you remark that uh, the way in which, you remark on the way in which the architectural object has come to be displaced by high theory. So, the production of knowledge, Jose says, mainly in the most advanced segment of architecture, but also elsewhere, started to undergo a major transformation in the 1960s. This transformation occurred in an opening up to various other systems of thought, such as semiotics, psychoanalysis, Marxism and structuralism, and a consequent rewriting of some of those systems' key concepts into architecture's idealect. This complaint and it would be difficult to read it as otherwise in the context of this introductory essay, as well as that of the broader project that it serves to introduce, recalls, to me at least, uh, similar complaints against theory in architecture that have been articulated in various forms since the mid-90s. As I note in the architecture of neoliberalism, and in some sense drawing on some of the, the sources you use as well, such as uh, Hayes's anthology, um, from the 60s to the mid-90s, theory's presence within architecture comes to be seen as troubling precisely because it posits all manner of unforeseen connections between architecture on the one hand and language, the unconscious, capital, 
class and gender on the other. Since these latter concerns are to be found inextricably lodged within the discourse and practice of architecture, the discipline is forced to acknowledge the presence of foreign elements. Foreign elements, each of which bears its own burden of unresolved contradictions. Uh, foreign elements that have been residing all along in the very places where architecture might have thought itself able to locate its own autonomy. And rather than enriched, rather than enriched by such encounters, architecture, like theory itself, in its relentless work of translation, correlation and displacement, finds its foundations unsettled. It finds its foundations unsettled, and according to some, its mission compromised. So Michael Speaks writes that theory attached itself to architecture at this time, before driving it towards a resolutely negative condition. Architecture finds itself then not the master of its own house. What follows from this discovery, mainly from that most advanced segment of architectural discourse and culture to which Jose refers, are a series of efforts in which it attempts to extricate itself from its apparently inextricable condition of being mediated. There is the pragmatic turn represented by Michael Speaks, my favorite, one of my favorite quotes to use here. Theory was interesting, but now we have work. There's the post-critical turn associated with Sommel and Whiting. There is the turn from the negativities of critical theory to the affirmations of Deleuze and Guattari, the turn from meaning to affect, the turn in Schumacher especially from Marx to managerialism. What Jose, though, what Jose appears to want to affect in the project of the building is a kind of reversal of Kant's Copernican turn for architecture. Um, I don't know if that's something that's occurred to you, and you might profoundly disagree. So I'm just offering you my reading here. So what I mean by this is that the architectural object that has been displaced from its proper position at the centre of things that has suffered at the hands or minds of high theory is restored to its rightful position as the locus and source of all architectural thinking. Right, this might be a surprise. And this is a very English way of putting it, as opposed to Beth's more straightforward expression of sympathy to the project. Actually, I'm not entirely unsympathetic to this project. <laughs> or at least to its motivation. Unlike earlier turns against the possession of architecture by theory, Jose's project is not explicitly, or in fact at all, against thinking um, and not explicitly against theory, but is rather concerned with how these are conducted and of the place of the architectural object within them. His complaint, as I understand it, against the deployment of theory is that it is, in his words, unidirectional. That it supplies ready-made concepts which are subsequently applied to architecture simply to prove the validity of the theory. Architecture, in such practices, serves simply as an instrument, an illustration or example through which theory reasserts what it claims to know already. And this, that, that kind of practice, which is being uh, criticised here, this is hardly a critical practice of theory, even if it appears wrongly to be a practice of critical theory. The same might be said, something like the same might be said, of the architectural uses of theory, deconstructivism or Deleuzeism, where architecture has been employed as little more than a vehicle through which the architect might illustrate his or her uh, philosophical credentials and their allegiance to said theory. In the attempt to affect this anti-Copernican turn for architecture, so that's one that restores 
the architectural object to its proper place at the center of architectural thinking, however, one might discern the emergence of a problem of a different sort. In attempting to escape conceptual mediation, architecture nevertheless burdens itself with another concept through which it thinks, namely that of the metaphysical conception of the architectural object. In seeking to establish that which is, in Jose's words, irreducibly architectural, and in the proposition that architecture is best thought of outside of, or at least prior to, any mediating concepts, the political, the economic, the social, the semiotic, etc., the danger is the danger is that knowledge and thought are imputed to the architectural object itself, in and of itself. That one starts to talk, as one, you know, these, these the, the terms that jumped out to me, that one starts to talk about the ontological primacy of the building, or, um, to reference Ersprung again, of what buildings know, or of the building as a form of knowledge in its own right. Now, to invoke Marx, one of those conceptual mediations, of course, in trying to make architecture stand on its own two feet, one courts the danger of also allowing it to stand on its head so that it starts to spout grotesque ideas. But against this personification of the object, which is for Hegel and Marx and everyone who follows on from them, that's the, 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 the mark of fetishization. Critical theory, as practiced within the Frankfurt School, endeavored to show how the object mediates and is mediated in turn by the larger totality in which it exists. Mediation then need not be uni unidirectional. It need not take the form of the application of theory to architectural objects. So in the critical theory of the Frankfurt School, in fact, the proposition is precisely that mediation always goes both ways, that it isn't a unidirectional process. It's a dialectical process, rather. So the basis of Adorno's critique of identity thinking, after all, of his complaint against the way, sorry, is, is his complaint against the way in which the concrete example is subsumed under the ready-made concept to which it is made to appear identical. So I think that there's something already in there within the Frankfurt School and their methodology that might be drawn on to um, effect this uh, change you're, you're, you're looking to achieve here. So for Adorno and others of the Frankfurt School, theory is understood as itself necessarily changed through its encounter with its objects. What they called the labor of the concept, like all forms of labor, is itself critically reflected upon so as to reveal and reflect upon its working. So the, the obvious examples of what I'm talking about here, the most obvious example is Walter Benjamin and his arcades project, but there are lesser known but equally significant examples. Uh, the one time that Adorno engages with architecture where he's writing about functionalism uh, and, and Loos, um, or Krakauer, Siegfried Krakauer's writing on hotel lobbies or cinemas. And these, these undertakings, they show the possibilities of thinking through and with architecture, of understanding architecture, including the thought of architecture, as mediated by the social, the economic, the cultural, the political, etc. And at the same time, they show how architecture recursively acts upon critical thought, enabling it to adapt, sharpen and refine its capacities. So, for example, when Benjamin is, is you know, his, his, his work in the Arcades project is not, it's not the application of a theory, it's the thinking through of a particular condition and its possibilities through architecture and through thinking through the experience of that. So, um, 
I, I could urge that we not abandon mediation. Um, more importantly, uh, this is impossible to do anyway. And it, it's what we have to work with and work through and work on. Thank you. I'd just like to um, kind of transition and ease with a, with a small kind of, with something that everyone probably m must have heard by now. So the, the recent announcement of the Reba Sterling Prize 2017 was awarded to Hastings Pier. And, um, and the kind of widespread reaction to, uh, to the decision was that there is clearly a lack of building. And this was heavily discussed in popular media, on the radio and newspaper, uh, by specialists, by architects, but also by people who are non-specialists. And, um, and this kind of um, uh, reaction, it really intrigued me in the sense that, um, so what Jose has done with this project and presenting it um, in, a, in a critical sense, um, and now we're still in that conundrum where a building which clearly the field had no problem with, but it's still being questioned as in, has the building in its definition and in its presence uh, being reduced or narrowed down to something which um, even the public can challenge the specialist in that sense. And, um, and also, um, the, um, the architectural power that's achieved through the, and what the, what Alex de Reich, so the DRM and the practice, um, representing the practice, he explained in an interview to say that there is a pleasure of space that comes with the lack of material presence. So that was in the architectural statement, explained in public. Um, but yet, this architectural power achieved through the most subdued sense of material gesture should be questioned. Is something which um, perhaps can raise some, some uh, issues to be discussed here. And I like to, there's some really brilliant responses from the, the three speakers. And um, what I'd like to suggest is perhaps two directions to speaking to the issues. One is there seems to be a question of if the building can actually be verbalized or be textualized in the sense that we can actually talk about the building in words. Um, and also this search um, or the necessity of a new vocabulary, which Jose was suggesting through several of his final slides. So, so, so words such as sameness, um, subjectivity, um, boredom, um, which didn't come from architectural field per se, uh, as he suggested, is something which we should not use to discuss the building. And so the, the question of terms and definition is bound together. And perhaps there is some is, let's say it's, it's polemical if that this can remedy the assumed division between theory and practice, or the division between um, design process and history and theory, and either through education or, or in the professional field. And the second strand, which I like to also kind of, uh, in a way, simplify in, in, um, as an issue, is um, that of relation. So if the building, in a way, Jose is trying to pose it as, let's say, a generalizable term, can be discussed not only through a singular digging of one building, or one portfolio of buildings, but through perhaps um, previously non-related uh, adjacencies, perhaps in the situation of urbanism, in the situation of uh, collective building activities that may have consciously or unconsciously related to one another through space and time. So one is the question of terms and definition, the other is the question of relation, agency, and uh, collective reading of the building. And I, th I hope that's broad enough for any of the speakers to respond either directly to these two issues or to respond again to each other's uh, proposition, which there's a lot to discuss. Um, who would like to take the lead in doing that? I think you should have a chance to respond to your harsh critics. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, all right, a um, couple of things. Mm. Not all architecture is a building, right? Mm -hmm. For sure. And um, <coughs> the only way to discuss architectural thinking is uh, not the building, for sure, right? 
That means you can find actually the thinker materialized in a number of different ways, which uh, you'll have uh, um, ex uh, exemplified um, in, in various forms. Um, basically here the argument is that the building does seem to be one of the main objects through which to get at this domain of architectural thinking as a form of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Not the only one. That's, that's one thing, right? Um, so this project happens to be on the building. It could have been on infrastructure, it could have been on body of work, it could have been on a number of other, um, of other topics. The same way if you accept playing soccer, you're not playing basketball, right? You're playing soccer, right? Um, so uh, I don't have anything against all of that. Actually, I think that is necessary. I agree with all of you. It's just that they are different projects, right? Um, then that's one thing. Then the other thing is that, and that's why I mentioned in the introduction, a building is not necessarily an object, right? And that I will do some self-criticism because I don't think it's uh, entirely clear in the introduction, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I think this is slippage in the introduction around the term object because it can be understood as an object in the empirical sense, which is to say a self-contained reality mm -hmm. with um, clearly delineated boundaries which dissociated uh, from its surrounding fields, so to speak, versus a building as an object of knowledge. Right? Mm -hmm. So what I mean is the latter and not the former. Right? Uh, as has been pointed out in other events, a building doesn't necessarily have to be an object. It can be something more infrastructural. It can be more, um, well, I mean, Stan, for example, mentioned a couple of times he's into field conditions, right? So it can be something that merges with the background, right? It can be found in the uh, slightly uh, urban scales or in between for sure, right? And part of the job uh, that hopefully this project does is to also kind of reach into those middle scales or blurry or blurry boundaries, right? Um, so, um, well, I'll leave it at that, right? For now. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> But the majority of the examples that came forward and the contributions yeah. dwell very much on the building as an object. They don't extend into those blurry territories. So I guess the question I would have is, is there a problem with setting up the question or the title, the building? Because mm. it, it sort of preconditions everyone to think in those terms. Yeah. So uh, I guess that's, that's what I mean partly by accepting the rules of the game, right? So the idea is to say, well, let's see if we can create uh, interesting place uh, by accepting the rules of soccer, right? Let's see if we can create something interesting and contribute something to the discipline or to the history of soccer, right? Let's see if we can do it through the building in, in, in architecture, right? Uh, even then, there are at least, I would argue, 25% or 30% of the case studies, especially in the section content, and in some of the ones uh, under the label context, which actually do extend beyond um, the building in this, uh, let's say, quote unquote, reduced sense of the term. And in some cases, basically to the point of almost deconstructing it, I would argue, right? Uh, the same is true for some of the responses as well. Right? So in that sense, um, there is this, um, let's say this, uh, a number of alternative views on what it means to invoke the building as an object of knowledge included within uh, the project itself, right? Which I appreciate it. I wouldn't have wanted for everybody to kind of stick to the same thing, right? So, um, yeah. Yeah, well, it strikes me we're being slightly tough on you, but I mean, that's, I guess that's why we're here. Uh, not <laughs> getting paid, that's your whole not point. being paid, that, but, yeah, uh, but we're here, I mean. Um, I mean, any of us, we put forward a project, we're going to get, you know, critiqued. That's fair enough. But I mean, that, that's part of the process, isn't it? That's part of the healthy mm. process. You know, we all realise we have our tropes, our limitations and things like that. But I think it's a very interesting project. I mean, I've got masses of sympathy for this as well. Um, I just get slightly worried that certain kind of coded meanings get put into it. Doug's, I think very, very clearly worrying about the slightly intellectual, slightly kind of um, say, reified view of architecture might happen mm -hmm. if, if we narrow it down too much. I think that was Doug's warning very, very clearly as well. So that's, I know no, that's not your project, but I'm just saying we're always worried about how these things might be read and how yeah, they yeah. might be interpreted, yeah. etc. One of the other things I would, I would, just, I would just say, I, mean, I know I'm slightly banging on about this, but this idea of design research, when we, we do the PhDs at the uh, the UCL, um, we have quite a lot of people doing design-based research, but a lot of the theoretical research, Sophia's here as well, tutors them too as well. So we have these people doing very, very high-level 
uh, kind of stuff as well. And then, but they're also doing design speculation. They're they're, they're proposing mm -hmm. things around buildings. And then, because of the nature of the subject, we we, we have co-supervisors with other parts of UCL. Mm -hmm. And I get slightly worried this idea that somehow other disciplines don't want to listen to architecture, or don't know how to listen to architecture, or are not particularly interested in architecture. Mm -hmm. Do we explain ourselves to other disciplines? Our feeling, our experience is that they act opposite. Mm -hmm. We have people working from a whole range of disciplines around UCL who would, who just love. They think this is amazing. They think this ability to use architecture to think theoretically through spatial propositions and through design is actually very liberating for their subjects and they're, and they're really energized by it you can imagine they're reading lots and lots of papers about very very similar things all the time and here they've got a chance to think about it from a completely different point of view so i've got the feeling we, we've actually got this capacity to engage very very well without you to export and to, and to engage with people we i think it's it's kind of weird we almost like we build these myths and stories around us to, to keep ourselves in looking and so it's like telling these other ghost stories all the time so we don't go out at night or something like that. It's a bit like this, you know, there's something very odd about the way in which we do this. Yeah. Really, and, I th and I think my experience is completely the opposite, you know, that people yeah. are actually genuinely interested in how we do and how we see things and how we conceive buildings yeah. as well when it comes to design. And, I just, and again, I get worried that it's always a bit like some defensive. Yeah. No, let's, yeah, let's, well, let's see if we can ourselves out yeah, before yeah, yeah. we can talk to other people type of thing. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, let's see if we can something out of it. Um, so as somebody who uh, teaches design, right, I am super interested in design research, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. And um, um, it might have a greater effect than, let's say, so-called, um, I don't want to call it like highly intellectual um, projects, but projects of a different kind. And this of a different kind, I think it's important, Murray, right? because uh, this is the reason why I differentiated between discursive and representational knowledge, right? Design research uh, relies mainly on representational knowledge and also, also on discursive knowledge. But I think we can have a discussion as to the degree and kind of discursive knowledge that's embedded into design research mm. relative to a, let's say, purely intellectual endeavor. Right? Purely intellectual, let's say, in the traditional sense of the term. Right? So the kind of work that gets done in a scholarly circles. Right? But you've been purely written, don't you? Mm. Not purely intellectual, I mean, because essentially it's an intellectual activity as well. If you mean. I mean, again, it's, it's just terminology. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's, like it's intellectual, but I think when you sit on a, on a jury for a design project or a design research project, mm. the, kinds of, the kinds of things you, try, you tend to appreciate in the project mm. are often of a different kind than the ones you appreciate in, a, uh, in an argument of a certain kind, right? The argument is going to favor it's, I don't know, it's synthetic character, it's number of layers built into the different yeah. steps through which to uh, arrive at a conclusion, the number of different, those are qualities of a discursive kind, right? Whereas in a design research context, you tend to appreciate drawings or the way they are connected to one another, and in turn, the way they can connect to concepts as well, right? But that's already a different yeah. thing, in, in my view. Well, right? I mean, I'm, I'm arguing, I'm sorry, yeah. I will stop talking about this, I'll promise yeah. So, um, for me, design research is, is a research when design is one component and amongst other forms of knowledge production as well, and the kind of the written work yeah. that our design research students do is just as intellectually rigorous well footnoted, constructed as the people who are doing purely written work, it's, it's just less of it because they're doing other stuff as well. So again, I get slightly worried that there's this division, etc. I mean, it, it, the, I, I was, again, I'm just flagging up. I think the danger is these intellectual preconceptions we might have beforehand that maybe kind of force us into these positions which are not really that uh, healthy. That's basically is, my is concern. Is the concern that you're um, mm. alluding to, because I'm just trying to it out. Is it, is it as Douglas was suggesting where at certain points architecture has become a vehicle for kind of e expressing a, a kind of theoretical concept rather mm. than the, which I would understand design research to be, to fold all of these things together, yeah, yeah. rather um, the architecture has been a product of a kind of process that comes out of a, out of a, mm. a theoretical concept and has nothing to do with the other kinds of bodies of knowledge mm. that frame architecture. Mm. Whereas I would understand design research to be the, the joining up of all of these things mm, and I would absolutely mm, advocate mm. And, and, and support that. Is, is that where the concern comes from, the kinds of moments in architecture where it's become absolutely subservient to this kind of theoretical process? 
Because I thought Douglas kind of articulated that yeah. quite well, and I thought that was a sort of interesting reading of it. Yeah, but um, I'll, I'll try to answer tangentially by also answering <laughs> to, uh, to Douglas. <laughs> I killed two birds with one stone. Um, well, j just to everything you said, right? Um, I mean, everything you said has been, uh, yeah, I mean, you mentioned all the references have been written about and, and, and carefully thought through. Uh, all of that is, um, I mean, I completely agree. Architecture is mediated the same, the same way other practices are as well, mm -hmm. right? So the idea here is um, not to replace anything, right? This is not a, a project of replacement, right? Mm -hmm. This is a project of uh, coexistence, <laughs> right? So uh, the way I laid out the argument at the beginning was to say, well, there is a kind of uh, dominance in my view, even though, yes, it is tied to a certain uh, American East Coast, uh, American mentality and its interlocutors, as I say in the, in the introduction, so there's nothing uh, there, there's no hiding there. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, if that is a dominant pattern, let's see if that dominant mm -hmm. pattern can coexist with this, uh, with this proposition. Right? Yeah. So there's not a, a restoring of the building to the center, right? That makes me very uncomfortable. Uh, even the term core, which I forget actually if I do use in the, in the introduction, I, might, I, I forget, uh, also makes me very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It's more of a, uh, of a coexistence on, and of a looking into ways in which architectural thinking can grow, actually, mm -hmm. can grow um, within, as I said, the map of, the map of uh, human knowledge. Uh, so when you use the term architectural thinking, what is it that's thinking is it do you mean what architectural theorists write or architects write or uh, uh, the the thinking that goes into the design process Dis discursive knowledge yeah discursive knowledge so it's thinking about architecture no it's thinking through architecture Right. Yeah. I see somebody who yes. trying to raise a hand. I don't know if she wants to just. Um, I was intrigued uh, a few moments ago when I think I heard you say that not all architecture is building. It surprised me in a way that you would say that because I would have thought that your position is that you are trying to approach point where you can dogmatically say architecture must be building um, because it seems to me that even if an individual act of drawing or designing uh, doesn't get built and even if it doesn't expect to get built it must as it were ontologically presuppose that it could be built and that building will be going on and that it is of that ilk of things which presupposes that it must be built. Uh, it's about 30, 40 years ago now before, since uh, Leon Creer in this room famously said, because I'm an architect, I do not build. But he didn't say, because I'm an architect, I don't want to build. The presupposition was there. It was an ontological imperative not necessarily in every individual act, no more than every individual hour of your day is being an architect. But the project collectively must center on getting built. It's a bit like otherwise you're in the position of a composer who doesn't, is not bothered about the stuff ever being played or even heard. Um, yeah, to me there are two different issues there. Uh, one is whether what you're doing is going to get built or not. So the issue of actually materializing uh, that which you are designing or the enactment of architectural thinking, that's one issue. And then the other issue is regardless of whether you're building it or not, whether what you're doing being a building or not being a building actually embodies some kind of architectural thinking, right? For, for me, those are two separate issues. Sometimes they go together, but they're, they're separate. And I would say, indeed, there can and there is often architectural thinking embedded in something that doesn't amount to the definition of a building by any stretch of the imagination for sure. And on top of that, that even if you don't actually build it, and I would argue even if you're not even presupposing the fact that you can build it, there can still be architecture into your drawing or in, in the design process that you are 
conceive it in a particular moment in time. Yeah, but that's on, I mean, <clears throat> I think you're placing too much emphasis on knowledge and epistemology. I'm trying to speak existentially here. Okay. I mean, architecture is an activity that only exists insofar as it ever gets built. And so therefore, you know, obviously in a complex society there's a division of labor and there will be contributions to the discourse that don't themselves get built, but they can only proceed on the assumption that something is going to get built. So are you arguing that there can only be architecture if that presupposition exists? Is, is, that, is that your claim? I'm, I'm kind of surprised because I, I, I uh, rather like Doug, I'm not unsympathetic oh. to <laughs> the proposition. Um, I, I spent an afternoon talking to students about um, architecture as media. Um, but I, I said to the students, this is a partial view there are tectonic issues that this is entirely excluding sure. yeah. and many other um, propositions about what gets done at all, let alone built. Um, but amongst all the things that get done, buildings have to get built. Maybe I'll stand up so you can see me. Uh, I think I can appreciate that the project has a, as a condition, an attempt to redevelop or maintain a kind of minimal disciplinary consistency for architecture around the building, around the sort of practice and objects of architecture. Uh, but it, does, it seems to be lacking a kind of appreciation for the material and historical contexts for the discipline's sort of strategic necessity for consistency or for the consistency of the discipline in general. So this, this is something like the, what Tafuri calls the institutional character of architecture. And it gives the whole thing a kind of pre tafurian character that doesn't seem to address the political and social basis of architecture, say in the relations of production. Yeah, I mean, same, same answer I gave earlier. Um, there is a lot of work being done in that direction currently, and uh, all that work is uh, very necessary and actually very often um, extremely interesting, right? Uh, this is just an attempt to offer uh, an alternative to that. Uh, and the one thing that's important to mention, perhaps, is that because it's happening in 2017 and not in 1970 or not in 1940, is that you're basically taking um, an object of research, in this case the building, and then um, have it subject to the intellectual tools that have come to our disposal today. Right? So uh, just by virtue of um, you know, sort of enacting that transference, something that basically a traditional object of study is going to get transformed and it's going to get uh, hopefully thought through in, in different ways. Right? So that's why um, I would not agree that you know, this project is kind of pre tafurian or it would be equivalent as one done in 50 years ago, right? Because the intellectual dimension around architecture has shifted quite a bit uh, over the past uh, four or five decades. The same way it has shifted in technology when it comes to design and fabrication or, or uh, a number of other things, right? or even inst institutionally indeed. Sophia. Here's a question at the front. Um, thank you, Jose, and thank you to the um, panel for excellent um, discussions and criticism. I've been following uh, both points of view, and I've been in both point in both of the Atlantic, so I can really see, <laughs> having been in the University of Michigan for, three, for six years and having done my studies at the Bartlett, and this is where I'm based now, I can really see the different points of view in the 
whole conversation. So, um, uh, perhaps it is a European um, uh, attachment to history, to our urban history, that makes us think about the palimpses that uh, uh, Marim mentioned, uh, about the socioeconomic dimensions and how they really impact on architecture, about the ideas of network, uh, the city, and the relationship between all these things and architecture. Uh, and this is the way in which we see things in Europe. But in America, there is a very, very strong uh, engagement with the discipline. Disciplinarity is the key word in American, um, in American academia, in architecture. Um, so although I do understand, because I think I, we really need to talk a little bit about why we are sympathetic to the project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we mentioned we are sympathetic, but why are we sympathetic? I've been a contributor, uh, mm -hmm. and I don't know if I'm biased as a contributor, but although I understand the contributions that are made to architecture from all these external factors, I do really think that we really uh, need to know what is produced within the discipline of architecture as well. So what are those relationships in the building that can give back something to society, back to the socioeconomic aspects, what architecture can really contribute back. So for me it's not either or, but it's this kind of in, uh, uh, interaction between these points of view. And I would summarize it as the, the dilemma between the autonomous versus the contingent object that Hayes mentions in his anthology. Uh, and it's not the aut autonomy, it's not contingency either, but it's, this, it's, it's both uh, points at the same time. I mean, I, I don't see them as, I don't see it as an either or question. Yes. I mean, I, I yeah. kind of pick up and, and respond to when I kind of pushed you on architectural thinking and, and then you say, so, uh, thinking through architecture, and I'm in absolute agreement with that. I mean, I, so, I'll say this at some point, I'm not an architect. So, I've, I've, a few times I've been talking with students and I'll, I'll let that slip and they'll go, you're not an architect, but you're the one who talks about architecture in history and theory. So, it's, it's kind of important for me because that's how, I'm, I'm interested in architecture, but it is a means through which to understand abstractions like subjectivity, you know, Capital, general equivalence, uh, commodities, these are all abstractions. And so, so for me, having a different perspective as a, a theorist rather than a practitioner, this, I'm, you know, I'm absolutely, what I'm sympathetic to is this notion of thinking through architecture as well. And I guess your notion of mediation really builds that link. Well, it is, what yes, I'm so it's mediation. Talking so about. You yeah, can exactly. have a managerial notion of what the, the, the ideal worker is. But you know, part of that being realised is through the mediation of, of space itself, through the experience, the construction of space as a con construction of a, a condition in, in which to, to work, for example. Can I can I ask if because you, you propose at the end that the, the, the kind of the, the body of knowledge that would be architecture constructed through this lens of the building alone would would be that page of terms that emerged mm. from that. Um, I guess it's sort of almost a question to both of you. Um, it's becoming a very elaborate panel discussion. Um, if, if you would understand those terms as being something that we could genuinely export in, in those means, because to me it says the, the ability of, of, of architecture or the building, whatever we want to talk about, how we want to relate to it, its ability to construct those relationships and, and its ability to um, frame the, the, the virtual or, or the non-visible um, uh, questions that come into to our yeah. existence that is so important and I, I do I think I would challenge whether those terms are the, are the ways in which we can um, construct a, a body of knowledge around architecture rather it's the fact that architecture has that capacity to contain those power relationships and us to engage back out with that 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 is, is the agency of architecture and I, I would question whether those terms like brick as book or book as brick is, is the way in which we're going to do that Is that the kind of end game that you're aiming for, that we, that we construct um, this, this list of terminology that would um, give us a language to communicate externally? <clears throat> um, I guess not all terms have the same potential. So the ones you picked were very intentionally I, picked. Yes, <laughs> um, yes, I am strategic. Uh, right. um, but, uh, I mean, there are uh, 
I mean, as you all know well, uh, several examples throughout the 20th century where uh, studies within a particular field became um, larger systems of thought. Actually, I mentioned a few of those in the introduction, uh, such that their impact uh, basically exceeded the original boundaries of where they were, where they were born. So, the studies on the sign, for example, which uh, uh, belong specifically to linguistics, became a, a system of thought with a huge impact uh, in, in art history, in architecture, in, in cultural criticism. Or in, field would be another field example. or Freudian psychoanalysis or Frankfurt School dialectics, right? All of these systems of thought and criticism and frames of judgment were born specifically in a particular discipline and then grew to become a larger system of thought. So uh, has architecture or architecture thinking or history theory ever accomplished something of that kind? Does it make sense at all to suggest uh, such a project in 2017 versus uh, 100 years ago? Maybe not. Um, is it possible? Um, what are the you know benefits of uh, interesting things about that? Uh, would it make our discipline grow? Is that something that we desire or is it something that we resist? Right? But there are definitely examples. Right? Um, we may have time for one short question from the audience. Oh, right. oh, I cannot respond to Sophie. Oh. <laughs> uh, your happy transatlantic relationship. Uh, I'd, I'd like to say, as somebody who's written a major book about this, I've been studying this a long time, I think it's been pretty disastrous what's happened in American academia. And, and the, 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 somehow we have to carry the can of responding to it. I, f I find it really quite offensive. I mean, I mean, I know other parts of the world are worried about European hegemony. Okay, fair enough. But I think we have to speak up where we see it as well. I went to this GTA, um, 50 years event, so you were there as well. Seemed to be all about some, somehow dealing with the, pro the, the legacy of Peter Eisenman. You know, this guy's you know, digging themselves out some kind of uh, formulation that Eisenman came up with a long time ago, etc. Let us not forget post critical theory. Disastrous, disastrous. We spent a long time trying to argue that one away, so we've done this well. Now we realise we're in a, a climate when there's a, a, quite a lot of senior American academics saying that architects have got nothing to do with research. Monica Ponce de Leon says this very clearly in her chapter in the book. I mean, I mean, it's shocking. It's there as well. John Ockman at the talk and is now published online. They're demonising research. Architects is not research. They're nothing to do research. We're going to have to sort of sort of fight back against this one. It's wasting our time. We've got other things to do. There are other intellectual projects to go on. We, I, I don't want to deal with this kind of narrow, rarefied. I mean, you call it disciplinary. I just call it very conservative, backward. I'm thinking. I mean, I, just, I mean, but still, that this gets rolled out, and we have to respond to it. And I think it's wrong. I'm saying this. I'm, I'm putting my line in the sand here, you know, because I just I think we've got this much more urgent things to get on with, and that's why I think the thing that Doug's talking about, you know. So I understand entirely your your sentiment. Is we are not we're all very sympathetic to the project, but be careful the company you keep. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Just uh, uh, again, uh, many. <laughs> going on what she said three here three weeks ago is precisely that Sorry. she was objecting to research precisely because of it, its Our excessive it's research. She says in that chapter. No, uh, she was objecting to the promulgation of research model in universities, yeah. and it was precisely on the grounds of its presumption of a certain disciplinarity, which is capable of being defined but as research. That's not what research is. That is somebody's narrow definition of research that we then have to try and unpick. That's what I'm saying. That's wrong. Well, why do, why are you so obsessed with we do not see keeping the word research? Way. I just said it's yeah. the word research. Yeah, but any sort of new knowledge that is created through a form of activity, this is what research is. I mean, it's a very open, elastic generous concept, you know, for people to be saying, oh, they don't agree with that, therefore after architecture is not research. I think it's just plain dangerous, I'm sorry. You don't get this in other subject areas, you know, somebody deciding, you know, that the old geography, there's these kind of intellectual problems, therefore geography is not research, or that kind of stuff. I just think it's, we have to be careful what we say. I think it's wrong. Um, you know, and, and, and I think this is my slight worry. Anyway, that, that, so I'm just saying, there is a, there's the risk, kind of, there are, you know, there's problems. Sharks in these waters. Yeah. So what they do in, in, uh, in other fields, I mean, the very, very few that I'm familiar with, is that indeed they have different types of research, right? 
So the term research does not stand for some kind of loose term which encompasses many different ways of approaching the production of knowledge, right? They have different kinds. So what it happens is that, as, as is often the case, purposes define judgment, right? Mm -hmm. So different uh, kinds of research which serve different purposes get to be judged, judged by different frames of understanding, right? Mm -hmm. So that's when we have to be uh, a little bit careful mm -hmm. because there are different uh, ways of approaching the problem of research in architecture and to judge one type by the frame of uh, judgment that actually correspond to another lead to um, a lot of undesirable things, I would argue, yeah. right? So uh, I don't think it's so much that you are in disagreement with the American culture. It's that, that you guys are speaking about different models of research which get to be judged by different frames of understanding, right? So what I hear you saying implicitly, you're not actually, actually articulating it that way, is to say that a shift, and in that I also hear John Ockman kind of not, not so different in terms of her claim, is that in enacting a shift towards design research, we might gain a, a better access to fields outside of architecture, which is basically what you said earlier in terms of, well, I don't find an issue actually with not being uh, listened to or actually not being important to fields outside of architecture. Actually, we do, right? So maybe what you're saying implicitly is that design research of all kinds of research within architecture happens to be a particularly successful model when it becomes about actually establishing a conversation with fields outside of architecture. Right? Yeah, one something of to, something actually, to think about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One of his benefits, but that's, uh, there's also many other forms of access research. We must have a broad church, and we must be tolerant. Uh, I watched the talk on uh, video, and I think what she was opposing was the financialization of research, or the financialization of architecture, uh, in the sense that some academics have to really tailor the research to be appealing to agendas which are pursued by funding bodies. Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is a response I would agree with John Ockman. Yeah. But at the same time, I acknowledge that the direction the whole discussion took was against any kind of research whatsoever, which I thought was highly problematic. Yeah, yeah. yeah really. I mean, you do different yeah, really. forms of research. You know yeah. the answer to this. Yeah. You know, that's, her answer yeah. was not the right one. Sorry. That is, that is I Sorry. think, very true, but that adds a, another dimension to the problem. I mean, that, that's, in a way, a different problem, because you do have to engage exactly the the issue of financing and everything else, right? Yeah. And see, but well, basically what she's arguing implicitly is that most of research have to be adjusted relative to, relative to. But if you, and then, and then it becomes, if you, if you don't teach, teach architectural research, because it can be financialized, and you can't do buildings. We're in a capitalist economy. I mean, buildings are capitalist as well. So, I mean, you wouldn't do it. I mean, where would that get you? So I think the answer is right. Find different models of doing it, yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that brilliant debate, and thank you for your willingness to stick with it um, for the evening. And, um, and just, I just went, want to end with just one statement from Andrew Benjamin's essay in the book. It says, it all occurred in the building. All occurred in the building. Okay. <laughs> so I'll leave that indulgence with you um, in architecture or outside of it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Good night.